From the POTUS studios in Washington, D.C., it's a special Sirius XM GU Politics Town Hall with Chelsea Clinton, Vice Chair of the Clinton Foundation, on the next generation of leaders and their impact on key social, economic, environmental, and political issues. Here are your hosts, Julie Mason, host of Julie Mason Mornings, and Mo Lathy, Executive Director of Georgetown University's Institute of Politics and Public Service at the McCourt School of Public Policy. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special town hall. Uh, really excited to have you. This, of course, is a joint production between Sirius XM and GU Politics featuring Chelsea Clinton. If you have a question for Chelsea Clinton, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function on Zoom. And we're going to try to get to as many as possible. We've got a little bit of time today, so don't be shy. Step up. If you submit a question, be prepared. We may bring you on screen to ask it on video during the event. We certainly hope you enjoy the event today and thanks for joining and of course thanks to chelsea welcome sorry i had to unmute myself thank you i'm very happy (laughs) (laughs) it happens all the time it's wonderful to have you and we should let you know chelsea's feeling a little under the weather today and i think she's a real champ for going through with the event so double thanks from us mo do you want to get us started i just i also just didn't have to caveat that's why i sound raspy like i'm channeling all those like 1930s movie stars even though I've never had <laughs> it's perfect for radio it's perfect for radio oh Chelsea. gosh thank you Mo. Yeah, I guess my voice just sounds more textured even though it's really just <laughs> the throat infection that you hear so Chelsea you are the vice chair of the Clinton Foundation uh, and you also head up the CGIU initiative there can you talk to us a little bit about that and um, its focus on young people sure so uh, the genesis of the Clinton Foundation uh, was really my my father's effort, which he's spoken about um, kind of like publicly and honestly, um, you know, to change the um, dynamic for antiretroviral medicines um, kind of 20 years ago, uh, which at the time had been kind of really only available and affordable for people in high income countries like the United States and were largely inaccessible. Um, practically and from a, an affordability standpoint in much of the world. Um, and so, you know, he and Nelson Mandela and others really got to work to try to change um, kind of the, the market dynamics from kind of antiretrovirals for much of the world being kind of a high price and low volume um, one to a high volume and low price one. And that then catalyzed still our work, you know, today and in the two decades since in, in global health, really trying to help make uh, vaccines and therapeutics and, and testing and, and training and so much more kind of more widely available. So that's f- fairly salient as we think about kind of where we need to go on, on COVID-19. I'm happy to talk about that um, kind of subsequently. And yet kind of along the way, one of the things that became most apparent to my father was how so many of the kind of uh, people who were most engaged in this global health equity work were were young people. And so kind of the foundation started kind of an an internal kind of real mentoring effort. And then that kind of led to kind of expanding that work with university partners. So now for more than a dozen years, we've held um, in person until this past year when we held virtually, you know, as CGI University convening, um, where we bring together um, young change makers from across the globe who have made commitments to action mode to help um, positively affect something um, either on their college or university campus in their communities and, and sometimes um, globally. And even though we had to transition that work over the last year to being kind of a virtual convening and a virtual platform to bring together young change makers to work together, collaborate together, ideate together, um, partner together. It's still been really exciting to see and not only so much enthusiasm, but so much real kind of strategic thinking and kind of already kind of real work in action to tackle um, kind of local uh, sustainability issues or climate change at a global level, kind of local health inequities or global health inequities, kind of local access to kind of um, more mentoring for girls in STEM or to help kind of change how we think about kind of what is a scientist? What does a scientist look like on a worldwide level? So um, a little bit about kind of the history of the foundation, the history of CGIU and at least what we hope to do 
um, kind of through our work every day. That is, it's a fascinating direction for young activists. Um, I wonder, well, a couple things. They're so drawn to healthcare. What's what's the source of that? And also this younger generation, Chelsea, it seems to me they, they're they such do-gooders in a way that their predecessors had good intentions, but but focused their efforts in other areas. Oh gosh, Julie, so lots of questions. So I think one of the questions related to kind of me and my interest in, in public health, and then I think the questions of like, you know, what do I think accounts for this this shift? Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of for me, like my interest in in public health really started um, actually in in my father's campaign headquarters in 1991 when I was stuffing envelopes because when you're a kid, like that's what you could do at least back when like people got real mail. Um, <laughs> and I know I, I imagine like young people listening just are like, wait, what is mail? What is, is stamp? What is a stamp? stamp. What is an envelope? <laughs> Like, what are those artifacts of, of time past? So I was stuffing envelopes and, and watching the nightly news. And um, there was a segment on Magic Johnson, who in November of 1991, he'll publicly disclose his HIV status. And I was so uh, struck by his courage and his bravery to just tackle stigma head on, his refusal to be bowed by stigma, um, his willingness to really kind of um, not only talk about his status, but to effectively put himself out there so that hopefully other people would talk about their HIV status. And so that really um, was part of what got me interested in um, kind of the detrimental effect of stigma in public health and in the HIV AIDS crisis. And now, you know, fast forward many years later, I have a master's in public health. I have a doctorate in international relations, kind of at the intersection of global public health. I have taught now for more than a decade at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia and, and do a lot of work with you know, the Clinton Foundation through the Clinton Health Access Initiative, kind of our global health work and, and also our domestic health work. So that's kind of a little bit about me. You know, I think, Julia, to your question around kind of young people who kind of are more, um, I think both more ambitious and more and more pragmatic in some ways than kind of previous generations. I think I first have to say um, that I really dislike the framing often of like, young people are gonna save us. Like, oh my gosh, like Greta Thunberg is gonna save us. You're like, oh my gosh, like Autumn Pel Peltier is gonna save us. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, like shame on us that we feel like- we they're not. Hey, but also like, <laughs> What, like, you know, with all due respect, like if you're an adult, like in your thirties or forties and like you still, we still have like many decades left to try to <laughs> the damage that we've caused and that our so just, just have to establish that. Cause I really, um, I find it quite like abrasive that like, oh, like they're going to save us. Cause I worry it then. Um, releases the responsibility for us to also do what we need to do um, as adults to make progress on climate change or gun violence prevention or public health. But I do think that young people today, you know, do feel a greater sense of urgency because things have gotten so much worse, candidly, whether we're talking about um, inequality or global um, like sustainability or insustainability than they were, you know, even 20 years ago. So I think that partly explains kind of why, um, why there's such a greater sense of responsibility, even though I think they shouldn't have to feel that sense of responsibility. And also I think because we know so much more about what works, we know so much more about what works on clean energy. We know so much more about what works to help prevent disease. We know so much more about what works to help treat disease. We know so much more about what works when it comes to actually like em empowering people to make decisions for their own lives when we think about kind of what we currently term like global aid and development. So I think it's both um, things have gotten worse, but also there is so much more that we know what works. So I think it's that convergence that largely helps explain like why, why young activists, why there's so many more young activists and why young activists in the best sense feel so emboldened. You, you know, uh, as you know, I run the Institute of Politics and Public Service. So I'm, I'm hanging out with young people all the time. Um, and, and one of the things that strikes me is that 
well, first of all, thanks for not giving up on, on my generation, Chelsea. <laughs> You're right. We still have some work to do and, and can still be in the game. But when we're talking about these big policy issues, I, I sense when I'm talking to young people that so many of the big challenges that they focus on, whether it's climate or health care or race, they talk about it less in terms of politics and more in terms of justice, right? The, mm -hmm. the connection mm -hmm. between these big policy changes and social justice um, seems to animate them and motivate them a little bit more than, than maybe people with as much gray hair as I do, um, as I have do. So I'm wondering if maybe you can talk about that and, and sort of that linkage between these big issues and social justice. Well, no, I certainly wouldn't, you know, I'm, also like not close to being a teenager. You know, my children are closer to being teenagers than I am right. a teenager. Um, so would never like be so presumptuous to speak, um, even for my own kids, much less like kids or adolescents or, or young people broadly. I do think though um, that, you know, how we name things, how we frame things matters. And so while I certainly, you know, believe that so much of what um, motivated President Obama and people who worked for President Obama or motiv motivated my mom, um, you know, in her time as a senator and secretary of state or as a presidential candidate, you know, motivated so many, you know, people of even kind of a micro generation ago, you know, in, into public service, you know, were toward more kind of just and, and equitable and sustainable kind of outcomes for more people and then consequently a more kind of just and equitable and sustainable kind of country and world. I, I do think that the language has shifted and that has become more explicit. Um, and, and I think that it's become more explicit maybe because the injustices have just become more visible to more people. Um, and I think that the focus on, on a more just world and the kind of greater justice that we need to reach that more just world, you know, makes imminent sense to me. Um, and I think certainly has more kind of moral and ethical um, kind of resonance maybe than just the kind of policy um, policies that were often focused on, you know, previously that were oriented toward a more just world, but weren't kind of um, articulated that way or, or kind of framed in that way. Um, and I think it's important that they all, <coughs> even if the policies, you know, even if the policies haven't shifted that much, I mean, we've had people talking about canceling student loan debt for years and decades, but I do think the framing of it as a as a gender and a racial justice issue, because it is both a gender and a racial justice issue, um, hopefully makes it kind of have greater appeal, kind of greater resonance, and then hopefully then the greater urgency to actually like get us over the line there. I hear so often, Chelsea, um, young people so frustrated with politics and the political system. And, and just to build on what you were saying, I wonder, do you see them, younger people, and I know you're not the spokesman for Gen Z, but bear with me. Do you see them veering more towards policy and less towards working on a campaign, maybe looking at running for office themselves? Have they become dispirited with the political system in favor of this, this more sort of policy direction? Well, goodness, Julie, I learned last week that apparently I'm a geriatric millennial. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. 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 Yeah. Uh, I thought I had a about being like labeled geriatric, but apparently not. Um, <laughs> speaking, I guess, as a geriatric millennial. Um, but reflecting on your question, I think thankfully we've seen um, a huge number of young people uh, run for office, um, work on campaigns, work on campaigns at you know the local, state, and federal levels, and and run for office at the local, state, and and federal levels. And I find that incredibly encouraging. Um, and we also see young people though organizing to put pressure on on politicians uh, at every level, kind of whether. You know, it's kids organizing to put pressure on their local elected officials to have comprehensive recycling efforts, or it's, you know, 
young activists organizing in many different ways to put pressure on kind of state and federal elected officials and the people who work kind of in the um, kind of complementary bureaucracies at the state and federal levels to ban fracking. So I do think we see young people engaging in a myriad of ways, um, kind of adjacent and kind of alongside politics. But I do think that we see a lot of people who are um, who are non-geriatric millennials and Gen Z um, running for office and, and working in campaigns. And I do think that's different than it was even a decade ago. And we have data to back that up that we have more young people running for office you know, in the last few years than we had a decade ago. So I think thankfully, um, while Julie, there may have been a, unfortunately more affirmative to your answer to your question you know, a, a while ago, um, I think thankfully we now do see a lot of young people um, stepping into the political arena because they know that who runs for and who holds political office really matters. I mean, we saw that mm -hmm. you know, rather painfully mm -hmm. over the Trump administration's, uh, thankfully, uh, one term era. Um, and I hope that we see only more uh, young people um, and, and not young people who feel called to serve um, running for office um, in an upcoming cycles. I know, uh, just to follow up, I know you said we should not expect them to save us. And I, I've taken that on board and I'm, I'm working on it. Um, are, do, you, do you foresee them in the future, though, blowing up the two party system? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> like, I, I'm so focused on on just the next election that I, I don't I don't even think about like elections candidly in the future because I think we have so much at stake in the next election, um, the next federal election and also um, the next elections at uh, various state and local levels. Um, and I just have never been like a long distance person. So I have no idea. Maybe I have no idea. Understood. Understood. Mo, what do you got? Um you know, you, you referenced earlier that you, through your work at, at CGIU and the Clinton Foundation, get to uh, in, interact with a lot of young social entrepreneurs who are working on big change from the local to the global level. I'm wondering, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, luckily we're about to, it feels like we're turning the corner on COVID, but I'm wondering if you have seen or the, the people that you talk to have, have expressed any sense that COVID has impacted the way people approach some of these issues. How has COVID impacted or has it impacted social change movements from the local to the global level? Well, Mo, you know, we're talking today, um, you know, like on a day where earlier um, this morning, the Biden administration announced that now more than 50% of American adults have been, you know, vaccinated against COVID-19, um, which is an extraordinary, um, achievement candidly for um, kind of for our country. And yet we know we still have a ways to go um, to ensure that everyone uh, who is able to be vaccinated is vaccinated. And there are lots of still access barriers that have to be conquered on the way to doing that. Um, and yet we know too that um, we have woefully failed to help vaccinate the world. We can talk about, um, we can talk about that later uh, if you'd like. Um, I have quite strong feelings about our our failures and what we um, should be doing and aren't doing, but hopefully are just not doing yet. Um, but to your question around kind of how I've seen COVID impact how young people think about um, kind of their work, I think absolutely. Um, sorry, Julie, this is becoming like a uh, like litany of things that annoy me. But another thing that annoys <laughs> me is go uh, for it. Thank you. In the framing of like, COVID has revealed all of these like structural challenges in our country. I'm like, oh my gosh, you just weren't paying attention. Like, <laughs> I know COVID is great. All these existing vulnerabilities that were there rather evident if you were attentive to them. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I say that because I do think that young people often were already working on kind of issues that relate to, um, inequities in kind of the ability to access healthcare or kind of the, the digital gap to help kind of kids be able to access the internet and have devices that could connect to the internet to enable them to access the internet. 
um, you know, all, all issues that um, we've just seen in stark relief, again, have not been revealed during the pandemic, where we know that um, kind of the kind of whether or not you had good preventive care, whether or not kind of you felt comfortable going to the doctor as soon as you felt sick, whether or not you were able to take time off from your job and you felt comfortable taking time off from your job to go to the doctor if you felt sick, all have had enormous um, correlations to who got sick uh, during COVID, who died during COVID, and all of that. Certainly in this country, although also in many um, Western countries, has been heavily correlated to uh, to race and to so socioeconomic status. Um, so I think that a lot of young people are already working on these issues, and then kind of that work has just become intensified and often expanded. Um, and so, you know, for example, like we have worked with students through CGIU who were working on helping, you know, non-native English speakers be able to access social services um, in the Bay Area by translating materials into, into Mandarin, into Cantonese, into Vietnamese, and into not, like a number of Asian languages. And then kind of they just broaden that work to encompass um, COVID-19 related services. So I think, you know, we've seen many ways in which kind of students, I think, just have worked all the harder on things they were doing already. And then the way students who were doing things that um, kind of help prepare them to support people um, more rapidly kind of were able to do that more quickly to ensure that um, people were able to access the um, the care and the services, and sometimes even just the information um, that they needed to help keep themselves healthy, um, to help kind of get a diagnosis, um, to help access treatment. Um, and now, you know, over the last months to help access um, COVID-19 uh, vaccinations. You're listening to a Sirius XM and GU Politics Town Hall with Chelsea Clinton. She's vice chair of the Clinton Foundation. We're talking Gen Z uh, and related matters. She's also host of the podcast, In Fact, with Chelsea Clinton. You can find out more at clintonfoundation.org. We've got some terrific questions lined up from GU and CGI students and from some Sirius XM listeners. Let's get started with Nancy J. Nancy J, do step up. And thanks to everyone who submitted questions. It's, we really love to hear from uh, other voices on the show. Thank, uh, thank you, Julie. <laughs> hi, Nancy. Hi. Um, hi, Chelsea. It's really, I'm really happy to be able to participate and thank you for being here. So my question is, um, I have a granddaughter named Chelsea and she is a beautiful, courageous, generous woman. What is the best part of being a very famous Chelsea? And how do you help your children navigate the life of a well-known family? Oh gosh, Nancy. So um, you know, the, I'll answer your two questions um, separately. So the, the answer to your first question has to start with just the honesty that I have never known what it is to be anonymous. Um, when I was, the day after I was born, I was on the front page of the Arkansas newspapers because my dad was governor of Arkansas. So um, I've never known what it is to not be known. Um, and with that has come some very um, strange experiences in life. Like, you know, when the tabloids claimed that I'd thrown myself off the roof when I was 12 to gain attention from my parents because I showed up in a cast to one of my dad's presidential debates in 1992, even though like I knew I'd fallen in ballet class. So like I knew I'd fallen in ballet class, but in like the tabloid reality, I had like thrown myself off the roof. Um, but I think weirdly, like all of those experiences of there being alternative realities and lies about me as a kid helped prepare me for the social media world that we live in today. Um, so I, I think there are though two things that have um, been very real benefits of um, having had um, a platform well before I even asked for one and having had a platform even though I spent the first few decades of my life like desperately trying to avoid um, kind of the spotlight um, was that one um, I have had a front row seat to my my parents work and the work of many other people that I really admire who have 
tried to make the country and the world a better place. Um, and I can't separate out that kind of front seat of being able to kind of be a witness and to be a supporter, to have learned from it, to have it helped inform my own work from the recognition that has in, invariably accompanied it. And then the second is that my platform has enabled me to kind of share the spotlight on me with kind of causes and issues um, that I really care about. And often people doing work that I think really deserve attention who otherwise may not receive it if I weren't kind of directing attention their way. So, you know, I use it to sometimes talk about things that are really uncomfortable, like the crisis of childhood diarrhea around the world, because it's not something we talk about enough, I think, anywhere. Um, I use it to help highlight CGIU students that I think are doing um, amazing work, you know, here in the U.S. and across the world. Um, and I wouldn't be able to do that if people weren't paying attention to me. All right. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, our next question comes from a Georgetown student, uh, Eric. And Eric asks, what is the Clinton Foundation doing? Oh, there's Eric. I'll let Eric ask the question. Hi there, Ms. Clinton. Thank you so much for being here today and allowing me to ask a question. Um, I, I would like if you could speak a little bit about what the Clinton Foundation is doing and has done to secure adequate health care for LGBT Americans. And specifically, um, is your foundation doing anything to combat the state laws being proposed and passed, which seek to deny appropriate health care to transgender youth? So Eric, thank you for your question. So the uh, Clinton Health Access Initiative only works globally. Um, so we do work on kind of I would argue like quite serious health inequities around the world. And we've done a lot of work with our partner countries to try to change laws that often have um, criminalized um, being as you do, um, and have done a lot of work uh, with health reform efforts in our partner countries to include um, healthcare services for LGBTQ youth, but also kind of people of any age. So that's work that we've done outside the United States. The only two kind of um, real domestic areas of health work that we do are um, one, we do work on uh, trying to help ensure that no one dies of an opioid overdose. So we've done a lot of, uh, we actually for many years have had the largest uh, program to distribute Narcan, the opioid uh, overdose antidote to um, kind of anywhere that people may be likely to overdose. So. Um, everywhere from fast food restaurants to libraries to public park areas to um, LGBTQ youth centers. Um, and the other area that we do work uh, with domestically on healthcare is through our partnership with the American Heart Association. There's something called the Healthier Generation, which is a schools based program where, for the first kind of decade of its life, was just focused on trying to help more kids have access to healthier food and kind of more physical activity um, in schools, but over the last few years has really focused on kids' social emotional well-being. And so kind of through that work, we work with school districts on their kind of health and wellness curriculum, including um, inclusive curriculum of helping to support LGBTQ youth kind of in their schools, which is often really important, especially in areas where they may not be getting that support at home. On a personal level, I personally have been um, really disappointed, to put it mildly, to see the rise of kind of anti-transgender laws around the country, trying to ban uh, kids from participating in sports that match their gender identity, um, ban the uh, provision of healthcare to, um, to children, especially. Um, it was incredibly disappointing to see my home state of Arkansas um, pass uh, particularly restrictive, although um, I don't know if it can claim to be the most restrictive, but a particularly restrictive and punitive measure um, against both kind of families seeking healthcare for their children, as well as the providers of healthcare. Um, because, you know, clearly that not only um, kind of is in violation of a healthcare provider's Hippocratic Oath, it's in violation of everything we know that's important about um, kind of public health, it's in violation, certainly what I think is important as a parent to be able to support kind of my kids to be their full selves. Um, and ultimately, like it's in violation of, um, of children's human rights. So 
that's not work uh, that the foundation is doing, but it is uh, work that I personally have been supportive of. Uh, I've been financially supportive um, and very much tried to use um, my voice, unfortunately not to very good effect in Arkansas, but I will keep trying uh, to reverse what's happened in Arkansas and to help stop uh, what is uh, very much kind of, you know, at the moment, it seems to be in, in transit um, in many other states around the country. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate the question. Uh, let's hear from Tina Tenda, Michael Simimeza, who's checking in from the University of Zimbabwe. Tina Tenda. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, she's not there. Oh, too bad. All right, moving on. Uh, Mo, do you want to call out a name? Yeah, let's bring up Ben. Uh, who I believe goes to Howard. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, my question for Chelsea is, um, how important is disability advocacy and what kind of social impact uh, can it make? I think disability advocacy is hugely important. I mean, there are um, hundreds of millions of people around the globe who are disabled. Um, often um, kind of we think of of disability, I think in this country as um, kind of someone in a, in a wheelchair. And yet we know that for so much of the world, it's yes, kind of, um, kind of physical mo mobility disabilities, but it's also kind of blindness and, and hearing loss, um, learning disabilities. And so I think it's hugely important, um, partly because, you know, no country has real um, inclusiveness when we think about kind of disability access, whether we're thinking about truly kind of access to physical infrastructure or we're thinking about access to um, healthcare or we're thinking about access to education. I think even over the course of the pandemic, um, kind of with the rise of, of telehealth, which has often been, I think, really lauded for very good reasons of helping to ensure that people could access care. Um, while at home without kind of making themselves vulnerable by going into a doctor's office or kind of to an urgent care center, often kind of that people framing has um, not included, you know, people with disabilities for whom it is um, challenging, maybe impossible to access telehealth services. So I think it's hugely important because um, we are nowhere where we need to be, not in the United States and not anywhere. I mean, even in countries that have much more robust social safety nets have really focused on kind of um, buttressing um, kind of public health infrastructure of having kind of universal health care coverage, you know, often still have real um, care disparities um, when it comes to kind of citizens in their countries um, with disabilities. We see this kind of in data, you know, from, from the UK to Australia and, and in between. I think it's really important because we have to keep pushing our elected officials um, to make the both legal and regulatory changes that we need to ensure that um, kind of um, speaking about the US, like Americans with disabilities are kind of incorporated in every um, kind of new uh, drug or device trial, for example, are able to access kind of every, every hospital, every kind of place of education in a way that is just not true today anywhere. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> um, so we've got a couple of questions sort of around the same topic. So we're going to bring up uh, Jalen uh, to sort of represent uh, them all. Jalen uh, from Georgetown. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. My question is, as a Gen Z member, members of our society still do not want to fully embrace young people's voices and goals on an array of topics. And my question is, how would you encourage young people to still become involved despite not always having a seat at the table nor getting the recognition that they deserve with their advocacy efforts? Oh, Jalen, I think that's such an important question. I mean, it's somewhat a question about um, how to persist in, in the face of maybe kind of repeated disappointments. And it's also somewhat a question of how to be strategic about securing a seat at the table when maybe um, kind of you weren't initially thought of um, kind of as to who might belong there. And, and so I think that, you know, the 
the the answer to the first question is I do really believe um, kind of in the core value of persistence in life. Um, and I do believe that um, kind of as corny as it may sound, the you know more we try, the more we are likely to succeed. And I do believe there are a lot of young people um, who have uh, proven, you know, that they very much um, can be listened to, um, but often aren't um, successful, you know, on, on first try. I mean, we have kind of the iconic example of Greta Thunberg, who sat in front of the Swedish parliament for weeks before anyone paid attention to her. And then, you know, a year later was, you know, leading climate marches with millions of kind of people around the globe. Um, but we also have, I think, um, you know, maybe uh, less uh, well-known, but equally important examples of that, especially when it comes to, I think, climate change, you know, really across the country and again, around the world. But I think sometimes you just have to build new mechanisms and maybe most painfully, you know, we've seen this in, in March for Our Lives. Um, and even March for Our Lives has had to often kind of reconsider kind of who's at the table and who should be listened to. I mean, I recently spoke to Bria Smith, who is a gun violence prevention activist from uh, Milwaukee, who was initially quite critical of, of March for Our Lives because of its focus on, on mass shootings and of how to really help prevent mass shootings. And, you know, she and others, um, many other, especially like young black women activists said, look, like we just have an epidemic of gun violence in our country. And yes, we have, you know, a series of tragic mass shootings, tragedies in schools, like tragedies in workplaces, tragedies in kind of social environments. We also have like the, the often daily tragedies of, of gun violence in many communities around our country. Um, and she's now on the you know, March for Our Lives board. So I think that it's both kind of just persisting. And I think it's easier when you're persisting together. So kind of when you're with people who can help support each other, because hopefully you're not all being discouraged at the same time. Um, and I think sometimes it's just having to build new mechanisms because um, maybe those that were constructed by an older generation, you know, and are still dominated by an older generation um, won't listen to you, uh, but maybe the broader public will, if you're able to kind of come together, create something new, kind of use your youth to be persuasive because you do by definition have a greater stake in what's going to happen because you're going to live in the future, God willing, for longer than even I will. Um, and hopefully you just build your own table, I guess, to continue to stretch the metaphor. Thank you, Jalen. Um, let's move on. Uh, Sylvia Gonzaga has a question for Chelsea. Let's hear from Sylvia. Hopefully she's here. We have Sylvia. Okay, terrific. Good afternoon, guys. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Sylvia and I'm from Brazil. And my question for Chelsea is, what do you think you could change in the US model, education model? And what other country education model that you were inspired by or you think it's a good model? And having parents is in politics, do you think it open your vision, your mind for activism or situations around the world that other kids doesn't have the opportunity or doesn't have the, the vision to, to work for, to fight for? Um, yeah, thank you. Oh gosh, Sylvia, lots of questions. So I think, you know, on your first question, like what do I think needs to change in the education model here? Um, in the United States, um, I think a lot has to change. And I think we have a lot of conversations in our country right now around what needs to happen uh, with higher education. And so I certainly agree that we need to kind of have different models of higher education that um, kind of better work for what students want um, for their own careers, kind of different kind of definitions, but equally respected definitions of kind of what, what college could mean for people. And we certainly, need to dramatically um, lower the cost, at least to students of going to college. But I think we have a lot of attention kind of being focused on that right now. And I, I agree that we need attention focus there. And I certainly agree with the solutions um, that are currently kind of very much um, part of what 
you know, Senator Warren and many others in the Democratic Party are advocating for. But where I think we need to be spending more attention, candidly, um, is actually on, on the younger years. Um, and I think, you know, we thankfully do have universal kindergarten now in our country, which we actually didn't have until fairly recently in every state. Um, but I think we need to really be focused on even the younger years. So, you know, there are in very few places, and I'm lucky enough to live in one, New York City, but there are very few places where there are kind of public educational offerings for, for pre-kindergarten, so four-year-olds or even for three-year-olds. And I think we need, you know, high quality, like free public education efforts for three and four year olds and high quality free kind of public care provision for for younger children. I mean, certainly we have seen how Im uh, important the care economy is um, over COVID, um, even though it's something that um, kind of many people have talked about for many years, including my mom, it was something that she campaigned on in 2008, but it was something she campaigned on in 2016 to try to help kind of make the care economy kind of the unpaid care that largely women provide to children and older relatives more visible and to compensate people who are providing this care um, to really recognize and kind of give dignity, but also to give remuneration kind of to caregivers in a very real way, but we've just seen how important the care economy is over the course of the pandemic, um, because at least, you know, here, um, Sylvia and I don't know the kind of um, the data in Brazil, but here, you know, the, the job losses have been borne um, you know, by women and, and predominantly um, by women of color. And the job losses have partly been borne by women because of kind of where COVID most impacted the economy from a sector perspective, but they've also been born disproportionately by women because women had to take care of our kids like while our kids were at home and like not going to school or not, you know, doing other activities. And so I would hope that coming out of the pandemic um, and of what President Biden has proposed is actually just the first step to really ensuring that we are investing in um, in the care economy, recognizing the care economy for what it is, but ultimately building, you know, public um, care and education infrastructure for our youngest kids, um, because I think that's what then will set kids up to succeed in kindergarten. Um, and we know that kids who succeed in kindergarten actually have a much greater chance of, of succeeding in life. Um, so that's kind of my answer to your question. I think we you ask like, what do I see work in other countries? You know, we see we see that happening in other countries. You know, we we can look at France and. And there's a public crash system starting from just a few months old in, in France where there's kind of care that transitions to being more educational to help kind of set kids up to succeed in, in school. And then to your question about like, how did having parents in politics, you know, affect how I think about what's possible in the world? Well, when I was little, my mom, you know, wasn't in politics, she was a lawyer, but she um, kind of always very much um, was engaged in service. So she was the chair of the Legal Services Corporation of America. So effectively the, the kind of national organization of legal aid societies in America to help provide high quality legal services to people who couldn't afford them on their own. Um, she was an education advocate, an early childhood advocate, an early kind of childhood health advocate. And so I grew up recognizing that there were many different ways to serve um, that you could serve you know, as we were talking about earlier in the conversation by kind of running for public office, supporting people running for public office, um, or helping to pressure kind of who's in public office or to help compensate for what the public sector is doing. Excuse me. <coughs> but that's the end of my answer to your question anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> Time um, out for coughing. So Let's all have some water. Done an active audience uh, down in Brazil, because that's where our next uh, person, I believe, uh, comes from, Fernanda Bogue. Hi, Ms. Chelsea. Um, I'm from Brazil, and I'm a part of CJU community, and I'm so thankful for that. And my question is, how can we encourage other people for our own age and younger to have the desire to create change in their young communities? Well, thank you. I would say that you would know the answer to that question for your community better than I would. But I do think that part of the answer always is ensuring that you and people like you, you know, are visible to young people because I younger than you to kids. Because I do think that oftentimes, you know, kids just think like, oh, like 
I, I can't do it. It's just too hard. Like kids don't make change. And so I do think it's really important to have young change makers visible to kids. And then I also think it's really important for people who may not be kids to talk about how the work that they did or the studies um, that they engaged in when they were kids helped them get to where they are. So, you know, I think about you know, Dr. Uh, Kizzy Corbett who helped create the you know, mRNA technology that uh, Moderna used to develop it, its vaccine. You know, she worked um, for the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institutes of Health here uh, in the United States. And you know, she talks about how her journey you know, really began when she was when she was 16 and she kind of had the opportunity to really um, learn kind of what does a research scientist do? You know, that got her interested in what she studied in college. That then um, compelled her to apply for an internship at the NIH when she was 19. So fast forward you know, to last year when she helped develop the technology for the mRNA vaccine with Moderna, although she'd been working on it for four years, you know, she was able to do that because of decisions she'd made, <coughs> excuse me, two decades earlier. So I think we also have to share those stories as well. And that's also the end admittedly to my answer to your question as I now call. <laughs> Fernanda, thank you so much. Terrific question. Really appreciate your participating. Uh, we have a question from Rasha al Haza, who is a student at Howard University. Rasha? Yes. Ah. Hi. 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 I have two, uh, two questions to uh, Chelsea. Uh, first one, what issue are you most focused on right now? And what world do you, uh, do you hope to see uh, for your children? Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Rasha. I mean, the issue I'm most focused on right now on a personal level, so kind of in addition to the foundation work that we, um, that we talked about, kind of ongoing work at the foundation, the issue I'm personally most focused on is trying to push the Biden administration to do what I think um, it needs to do because it can do um, to really uh, radically expand manufacturing capabilities around the world to begin to produce uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And to do that, kind of there are a few things that need to happen. And I'm not saying that they are simple, but I also wouldn't assert that they are overly complex. You know, so one, you know, I wish the Biden administration would support the uh, WTO patent waiver um, that South Africa and India first proposed in front of the WTO in October. So while we have said that we support it in principle, um, we are now engaged in negotiation that is expected to conclude uh, hopefully by December. And I just think that's way too far into the future and we should support the pre-existing proposal. And two, we need to uh, use the very real authority that we have I mean, I would hope moral arguments would be sufficient, but we also have a uh, very robust kind of legal and regulatory authority to uh, ensure that uh, Pfizer and Moderna not only kind of share the underlying um, intellectual property kind of through the patent waivers, but also share the underlying know-how of how to really kind of put the vaccines together. Um, Kind of three, we need to use um, our authority under the Defense Production Act, um, as well as just effectively our pocketbook to really scale up uh, everything that is needed to help um, produce and distribute vaccines. So all the raw materials of the vaccines themselves to then everything else that's needed kind of to ensure that kind of a vaccine can become a shot in arm. So everything from kind of vials to the trail trays that the vials are packed on, you know, to syringes, to kind of the cold chain and so much more. Um, and then I think also we need to invest in providing support to um, hire and to train vaccinators across the globe. We know that we can run large scale uh, vaccine campaigns. You know, we've done it um, in many uh, different uh, times for many different um, vaccine pre preventable diseases for children. And we've also done it at large scale at the height of the effort to eradicate polio in India kind of in the 1990s, there were more than 5 million vaccinators working um, 
kind of on the polio eradication campaign. So we know we can do like big things if we kind of just orient ourselves toward them. And then like, finally, I'd like to see us invest in, you know, helping countries really adapt their manufacturing uh, capabilities. Um, we know that it took Pfizer only a few months to change um, kind of manufacturing capabilities at its big plant in Kalamazoo, but also kind of in its partner manufacturing facilities um, are in Europe uh, to be able to produce its mRNA vaccines. We should be doing that work now. Um, and we know that, you know, <coughs> excuse me, for people who say, well, oh, like, you know, countries just can't do this. We know that there are different, you know, vaccines being produced in many different countries. And while it is true that the WHO says many countries don't have the national regulatory authorities um, to be able to really monitor kind of safety um, of vaccine development or production, and we also know they say about like 30% of WHO member countries do. So that's like just under 60 countries. Like that's a lot of places where we could be making COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and we know that we could be making them, you know, in countries that have good regulatory authorities and have kind of pre-existing infrastructure from truly like you know, Brazil, where some of our earlier questions, questioners were from, to Iran, to Indonesia, you know, to Tanzania, to South Africa, to India, to Pakistan, you know, to Canada, like there are so many places we could be doing this. Um, and it just deeply bewilders me uh, why we are not taking this bold global leadership position to help vaccinate the world and then to enable the world ultimately to then on an ongoing basis vaccinate itself. Thanks so much, Rasha. Chelsea Clinton, Vice Chair of the Clinton Foundation. Chelsea, it's been such a pleasure for us to host you. We're so grateful you could join us today, and I really appreciate your generosity. Thanks as well to all the students and SiriusXM listeners who took part. More on the work of the foundation and its programs at clintonfoundation.org and find the In Fact with Chelsea Clinton podcast wherever you get your podcasts. On behalf of Mo Alethi, Executive Director of Georgetown University Institute of Politics and Public Service at the McCourt School of Public Policy, I'm Julie Mason. This is POTUS, Sirius XM 124. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, everyone.